Uh, thanks a lot, Scott, and uh, it's great to see you all here so uh, bright and early uh, uh, in the morning. Uh, when I was asked to do a talk on the Bill of Rights, I said yes, thinking, well, there's an awful lot to say about that. That shouldn't be that hard. But the more I thought about it, the more it occurred to me that it really is just too big a topic to be uh, easy to talk about. So let me just tell you what I have in mind, uh, but uh, uh, you may want to redirect me <laughs> as the morning uh, uh, goes on. So uh, what I'm planning to do is to talk about uh, the Bill of Rights as a conceptual matter. That is, what is a Bill of Rights? How did it come about? What were the, the circumstances of adding a Bill of Rights to uh, our Constitution? What sorts of things are in Bills of Rights? How, how has this been thought about? Now, most of the things that we argue about and sort of care about about the Bill of Rights are much more granular than that. And so what I propose is that after we've sort of looked at this as a conceptual matter, that I'm going to shut up and uh, open the floor to you. Actually, I may, I probably will open the floor to some of you during the course of the early part, too, because that's just the way we do things in law school. Uh, I, uh, uh, but open the floor, and then you can introduce topics that are more granular. We could talk about anything you know, related to the Bill of Rights uh, and, uh, and uh, see what you're interested in. And so that, that portion of the, of the hour will be audience-directed rather than uh, McConnell-directed, and you can see if you can find things I don't know anything about, that would be extra credit uh, points. So in any event, the, so the Bill of Rights is a conceptual matter. Um, as you probably know, uh, the original Constitution, as it was hammered out in the summer of 1787 in Philadelphia uh, and ratified uh, over the course of the next six months or so, uh, did not have a Bill of Rights. Uh, so the addition of a Bill of Rights was actually it was an issue, and so they thought about it. Um, when we teach constitutional law, uh, none of you are in law school yet, but I suspect some of you will be uh, you know, in a few years. Uh, uh, it, we divide constitutional law today into structure and individual rights. Oftentimes, these are completely different courses, but even if they're the same course, they're going to be separate parts of the of the con law case book. They're going to be these are like this is the great divide in constitutional law and subject matter. And when you talk about structure, we think about uh, a limited government, meaning uh, the idea that the powers of the government are specified and limited. Government is not omnicompetent, at least in the American tradition. We don't think the government can do whatever it wants. It can only do certain things. Uh, Separation of powers, you know, uh, president, congress, courts. Uh, we think that uh, a dispersing power among different institutions so that no one institution can dominate is a good way of uh, protecting individual liberty. Uh, federalism, which is the relationship between the national government and the states, also based upon the idea that dispersing power between different uh, institutions of government is likely to be protective of liberty. So any, all that structure, and then we have individual rights, things like freedom of speech, freedom of religion, uh, uh, anti-discrimination, et cetera, et cetera, individual rights. And unfortunately, those two topics are not really in communication with each other. And I say unfortunate because that's not at all the way the framers of the US Constitution thought about things. They did not think that structure of government was one subject and individual rights were another subject. They thought they were the same subject, like two sides of a coin. Uh, <clears throat> and they began with the idea of natural rights and the creation of government. So this is um, not everyone was a Lockean you know, follower of John Locke. Uh, and there were certainly competing ways of thinking about public affairs and constitutionalism. Uh, but uh, John Locke provided uh, 
as close to a common vocabulary for, uh, for discussion of you know, constitutional structure as, uh, as anything. And we, so you begin with natural rights. So natural rights means uh, rights that people have in the state of nature. Now, this is important as we think of what, what is going to be the, what is the content of a bill of rights, right? Because a bill of rights is actually a law. It's a legal document, and its force comes from the fact that it's adopted through constitutional processes. But the content of a bill of rights comes from somewhere else. You know, why, why do people, why, why do the framers of the Bill of Rights choose uh, to list some things and not other things? And this goes back uh, to the beginning in natural rights. And it's an important to remember that for them, natural rights were rights arising in a state of nature. That's why they're called natural rights. Um, and they are not the same thing. We have lots of rights that are not natural at all like right to receive social security when we retire, if it's still around. I, be, I think it'll still be around when I retire. I'm not so sure for you. <laughs> uh, but, you know, so there are all kinds of rights we have uh, <coughs> that are not natural, but uh, the, as you'll see, the idea of the Bill of Rights comes out of a tradition in which they begin thinking about the formation of government from the point of view of natural rights. And uh, so John Locke had a very broad understanding of what natural rights were. He says famously that the state of nature is a state of perfect freedom to order their actions and dispose of their possessions and persons as they see fit within the bounds of the law of nature. And what's the law? The law of nature is essentially the principle that uh, other people have exactly the same natural right that you do. And so you have the right to uh, order your actions as you see fit. You don't have a right to interfere with somebody else ordering their actions as they see fit. So there's a kind of golden rule or reciprocity built in uh, to the idea of the law of nature. But that's the limit. And, you know, this looks like a kind of paradise in a way. Uh, you, you get to do what you want to do. Other people get to do what they want to do. We don't, uh, you know, we don't get in each other's way. Um, but there is a problem. Uh, and the problem is that uh, people get into fights. Now, this happens to be a quote from Brutus. I gave you Brutus's essay number two, so this will be familiar. Um, who is Brutus, you might be asking yourselves? Anybody know who Brutus was? I'm, 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 that's a serious question, not a rhetorical question. Brutus wrote a whole series of I think are the most profound essays criticizing the Constitution, but don't think that he's all, he's like a crazy person off in some different rhetorical universe. You know, he's very much part of the eight, late 18th century conversation about these things. But who is he? Anybody, so does anybody know who the famous Brutus, if you don't know who, the real Brutus, we don't know who he is. We, we still, you know, 235 years later, don't, do not know the identity of the, this person who wrote this brilliant set of essays. We have some guesses. Probably Melanchthon Smith of New York. Some people think George Clinton. Some people uh, uh, have, have thought Richard Henry Lee of Virginia. Uh, we don't really know. Melanchthon Smith is probably the best guess. Doesn't really matter. Uh, because he doesn't, give, he's not writing from the authority of who he is. Uh, he's uh, writing by the authority of what he says, and the name that he chooses for himself is quite significant. In a, in a way, we in our modern sort of social media world have re, have recreated this idea of of speaking out under handles. You know, in the blog world, you know, people often publish under 
names. Like I'll re regularly refer to somebody like, I'll say, uh, instead of calling him Glenn, Glenn Reynolds, I'll say, well, Instapundit wrote that. You know, so, uh, and just like the word Instapundit communicates a certain idea, their pseudonyms did too. So, you know, who was Brutus? Yeah, and, and that's what we learn, and of course, Shakespeare being our main source for this, and it makes us think that what Brutus is, is he's a traitor to his friend. He's disloyal. That's what I think most of us associate with Brutus. He turned on his friend. How terrible that, that isn't at all what they had in mind. What, same Brutus, but tell, what's the Brutus story from a pro-Brutus point of view? Yeah, or protecting it from being destroyed. At this point, they didn't yet need to restore it because it hadn't been destroyed. But think about this. There's a republic, and now you have conspirators, and they are going to turn a rep this republic into basically a military dictatorship through a charismatic figure who combines military and demagogic uh, characteristics. Uh, so what is, what's, why does this Brutus, what's he communicating when he calls himself Brutus? I'm gonna start calling on people who don't raise their hands. Uh, yes, so why does he call, what's he communicating when he calls himself Brutus? That he sees a rising threat of uh, centralized power, the yeah. power of kings, and that he stands opposed to it. Yeah, we've got a republic, he's saying. We've had a republic since uh, you know, independence. It's called the Articles of Confederation. It got us through the war. There's no president, right? It's a, it's a pretty weak government. People, lots of problems, but this isn't a problem of tyranny, right? And suddenly we have a, we, the, when the, when the pre, last year I did a talk on the presidency at this, your, your predecessors a year ago, the, the very, First day the presidency was debated at Philadelphia, the first comment by any delegate was Charles Pinckney of South Carolina saying, why? He'll be like a king. Right? This, this is a terrible fear. Centralized, militarily powerful, taxation, Anyway, so this is what Brutus is about. But he, for here he's just giving us a little summary of Lockean theory. Uh, and so uh, we have all these natural rights in the state of nature, uh, but, the, uh, but the big problem is that uh, everybody's fighting. And so uh, the weak are prey to the strong. Uh, your, your rights are not secure. Because every, everybody, we, supposedly we have this law of nature, which is lovely and reciprocal, uh, but there's nobody out there to tell us what it means in any concrete circumstance. Uh, there's nobody to resolve conflicts about it, and there's nobody to enforce it so that the strong have to obey it. And so this is the key Lockean problem. And the solution to it, as Brutus says, uh, is you create a government is established, which the force of the whole community is collected. Right? And the common good, therefore, is the end, meaning the purpose of civil government. Uh, to affect this end, it's necessary that a certain portion of natural liberty be surrendered in order to that that which remains should be preserved. So you give up, everyone gives up a certain portion of their natural rights in return for secure protection of the rest. Now this is a, um, a concept that we, we've almost forgotten about this because today when people say things like, oh, well, it's a natural right, uh, they, they mean something like modern human rights. They mean something that, that human beings must have even in the state of government, they can't give it up. That is not what, when you cannot understand the founding without, uh, if you assume that natural rights were like that. Natural rights can and often are given up. 
They can be alienated. You know, when the Declaration of Independence talks about unalienable rights, they're talking about rights that can't be given. Most rights can be given up, right? And they're given up in return for uh, more secure protection. And everybody agrees. I mean, this is this is not just you know Brutus and the anti-federalists. This is a very this is an across the board sort of standard Orthodox Lockean uh, view. And the way they're given up is in the form of delegating powers to the government. So the government gets the most important power the government gets is control over the institutions of force. So that instead of people fighting all the time. The government is going to have a monopoly over the legitimate use of force, and it's going to resolve problems. It's going to resolve controversies. And the idea is that everybody's going to be better off if that is so. Uh, and we know that this is what the constitutional framers had in mind, because as they finished their work on the Constitution, uh, they sent, they, uh, September 17th is Constitution Day. That's the day that the final vote on the constitutional draft is. And they send it off to the Congress for transmission to the people uh, for ratification with this letter. And short letter, but in it, it has this little summary of Lockean constitutional theory. It's just like what Brutus told us, too. Individuals entering into society must give up a share of liberty to preserve the rest. The magnitude of the sacrifice must depend as well on, this is so interesting, I think, interesting. It depends on the situation and circumstance as on the object to uh, be obtained. So what rights are being given up and which ones are being retained there is no, at least in this ideological universe, there is no philosophical answer to that question. You can't look it up in a book. It isn't, uh, it isn't a question of reason. It, it's something you figure out. And things like circumstance and situation and national character make a big difference. So there are a whole range of perfectly legitimate governments. You might have you know, a quasi-socialist government in which lots of rights are given up. And you have, you know, you have govern the government runs a whole bunch of things. You might have a more libertarian government in which you know, the government is fairly small. And, 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 and it depends on things. Our circumstance is we are fortunate enough to be across the ocean from any big enemies, right? And so we have a relatively libertarian uh, constitutional tradition, but that is just, it's something that, the, that our framers have to argue about and, and discuss and work out in light of circumstance. Uh, and it's difficult, to, it's difficult to draw the line between these things, but, um, but, but remember, the, the idea here is that um, as this line is being drawn, uh, the line, powers are on one side, rights are on the other side of the line, right? Um, and it doesn't really matter in theory whether you specify which rights you've retained or whether you specify which rights you've given up to the government it's in theory all the same thing. Right. So uh, Madison writes a letter to Washington while the Bill of Rights is under consideration. And he says, you know, if a line can be drawn between powers granted and rights retained, it would seem to be the same thing. Right. Seem to be the same thing. But there are practical reasons why maybe it's not.